Hello, my name is Pat Richardson and I'm publisher of the Carroll County Times. Over the course of the past 18 months, the employees of the Times have planned and implemented a community-wide celebration including events, programs, and promotions to share with our readers and our valued advertising partners our 100th anniversary. October 8, 2011 officially marked a century of publishing for the Carroll County Times. As a part of our festivities, Jim Lee, our editor, was invited to participate in the box lunch talks of the Historical Society of Carroll County. In the video you're about to see, Jim takes a look back through the 100-year history of the Carroll County Times. Good afternoon. Welcome to our October box lunch talk. We appreciate all of you coming inside on such a beautiful day and spending an hour with us. Um, I'm tempted to like run outside and hide for a few hours. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Um, I think a lot of you probably know Jim Lee. He is the editor at the Carroll County Times, has been there for about 15 years. I think many of you may have read the book that he did in, was that 99? 1999-2000 called From Our Front Porch, um, which was a decade by decade look at Carroll County history. I know it was very popular. It's hard to find now. You can find them in the used bookstores for a lot of money. So um, Jim has been doing a lot of research on the history of the times and um, they've been doing a lot of events. You've probably seen a lot of stuff in the paper. Uh, and so please welcome Jim as he walks us through 100 years of the Carroll County Times. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, it is a, a nice day, and it's supposed to be raining tomorrow, and it's been raining for the last month. So anytime that the sun comes out, I know everybody wants to run outside and, and just go do that uh, and do all the things that you should be doing or wanted to be doing outside. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our uh, 100 year anniversary. The Carroll County Times turned 100 years old uh, last Thursday. You may have noticed we did a special wrap on the paper. Uh, I was going to introduce some of the, our folks in the audience, but they've already turned the lights down. So remind me after the at the end that I'll introduce you to some of our other uh, team leaders and uh, department heads who are here for moral support and so that if anybody throws tomatoes or anything at me, they're going to get you. So don't do that. Uh, <coughs> But let's talk about the times for a little bit. It's 100 years. We had a, a, an open house last Saturday, which maybe some of you uh, stopped by. Uh, it was a great day. Again, it was one of the few days when the sun actually came out. So we really appreciate everybody coming out for that. Um, George Mather said that the county was in need of a strong Republican weekly 100 years ago when he started the times on October 6th, 1911. Now, the Democratic Advocate, which had been publishing since about 1865, was already pretty well entrenched in the county at that time. William F. Durr founded that publication. You may recall he owned the, uh, the Modell store uh, downtown. Uh, and the front pages of his early editions were pretty much all ads, just little advertisements. It looks like maybe the Walmart flyer that you get in the paper today or something. It was all ads, little news sprinkled here or there. But by 1911, or around the 1900s, it had taken on the look of, of a regular newspaper, had stories on the front, and uh, the ads were inside. You may remember some of those ads that were on the inside of those early editions. Um, a newfangled heating and cooking stove would be one of the ads that you may have seen at the time, or perhaps a new 1912 Model T for the going price of $700. So. Those were the type of ads that you would, you would have seen uh, in the paper at that time. Uh, George Mather's father, T.W. Mather, owned the T.W. Mather department store in Westminster. So you've got two department store owners with their own competing papers. Um, and Mather, Mather's father also owned the uh, Mather Printing Company, which sort of helped George as he was starting a paper. He had a printing company right there that he could uh, rely on. Another paper that was publishing at the time was the Sentinel. Now the Sentinel would continue to publish until about 1928. But the major competition for the new fledgling times over the years would be the Democratic Advocate. Now the Advocate 
Democratic advocate carried its political leanings in its masthead, Democratic. The Times, every day in the paper, would say, beneath the uh, subscription information in masthead, said, we're a Republican weekly. Um, and while Mather wrote in the first edition that biting sar sarcasm, mudslinging, or fault finding shall have no place on our page, quite often it did ex exactly that. And uh, they would praise everything that Republicans did and condemn pretty much anything the Democrats did. Now, they weren't unique. The owners of the Democrat advocate did the same thing. Um, anything that was Democratic was wonderful. Anything that was Republican was terrible. So over the years, they became rather skilled at insulting each other. And uh, you know, while at the same time making their own political party uh, look good or putting them on a pedestal. Now, this often bitter partisanship is interesting because most journalism historians peg the, the end of the 19th century or the beginning of the 20th century as a period when newspapers moved away from that type of partisan support and toward more balanced coverage. And I was looking into this um, when I was writing the history of the, uh, of the county, that was in 1999. And at the same time, I was doing some graduate work at American University, and one of my courses was uh, history of journalism. So I had to read books like Frank Luther Mott, uh, who actually only in American, his book American Journalism only devoted a couple sentences to community newspapers. And Edwin Emery, who wrote The Press in America, an interpretive history, history of journalism, and he also only gave like about a page or so to community newspapers. Even though these small newspapers then, as they are now, are still the backbone of the entire industry. So I was reading all that and I'm reading them saying, well, partisanship doesn't exist anymore and they're moving away from it and this and that. And I'm looking back, because I'm doing the 100 year history and I'm looking at the copies of the Times and the copies of the Advocate and the Sentinel, I'm thinking, that, that's not right. I mean, it, it, it's right here on the pages. The battling between them demonstrates that partisanship was in fact, you know, very much uh, a part of things. Uh, one example, when uh, Teddy Roosevelt came to Westminster three days before the Republican primary in 1912, the coverage that he received in the various newspapers was, was widely different. Now, for background, Roosevelt had served two terms as president. He rose from the vice presidency when McKinley was, was assassinated. He served from 1901 to uh, 1909. Now, William Taft was Roosevelt's hand-picked successor you know, for the presidency, and, and Taft won. Uh, in 1908, but by 1910, uh, he would pretty much alienated, alienated most of the uh, Republican Party with some of his policies and some of his ideals and things, and, including Roosevelt. So later when Roosevelt failed to gain the Republican nomination uh, over Taft, he split off to form his own Bull Moose Party. But this happened right before, right a few days before the primary, he came to Westminster. Now, the advocate Democratic in its leanings took the occasion of uh, Roosevelt's visit as an opportunity to blast pretty much everything Republican. Now, while some of the Republicans liked Roosevelt for standing up to Taft and for you know taking stands on issues and being correct, and they considered him courageous, an editorial and the Advocate found them uh, nothing more than extreme bad manners. That's what they wrote. In total, the news coverage of Roosevelt's visit, visit in The Advocate was four paragraphs. He came, he spoke, he left, the end. That was it. Doesn't matter. The Times, by contrast, saw the visit in an entirely different light, as would be expected. It wrote this expansive news story, including this sentence. The streets were packed with humanity. The strictest attention was paid to every word uttered by the speaker, and the very best of order prevailed. Wow. A little bit of a difference there. An editorial in that edition uh, further praised Roosevelt and highlighted the immense enthusiasm of all those who were president, present. Now, similar praise like that was routinely bestowed upon the Republicans. During the primary seasons, during the election seasons, if you picked up the Times, you saw lists of all the candidates, and it told you where good Republicans can go vote, or we can go register, or other things. Only the good Republicans could go there, apparently. Now, if you read The Advocate, you could read where all the good Democrats could go vote, and not a word about the Republicans, not the Republican candidates, anything. Here's our slate. Here's who you're supposed to vote for. That's it. All right. So in July 1912, just by coincidence, the Democrats held their, uh, their national convention in Baltimore. Now, The Advocate devoted 
Now, strictly, the advocate strictly local Carroll County newspaper. Well, it devoted tons of coverage to this. Uh, Th this thing that was happening in Baltimore because it was Democrats. On the editorial page, the editorials wrote, af after the nomination and everything, the, uh, they wrote, it is with great pl pleasure and party pride that we place at the head of our columns this week the name Woodrow Wilson as the nominee of the Democratic National Convention for the President of the United States. Now, from that edition all the way through the uh, election, all the Democratic candidates were listed in the paper. Times did the same thing, but they did it for the Republican candidates. When Taft won the Republican nomination, the Times reported that, you know, throughout the campaign, their ca candidate had displayed dauntless courage and unshakable integrity, a quick and all-embracing sympathy, a deep and abiding sense of justice, and a limitless capacity for hard work. Boy, you just want to vote for these people, don't you? That just. <clears throat> but neither part paper ever saw the other in a good light. What you see depends a lot upon where you stand. For instance, following a Republican rally in, in Westminster, the Times wrote, there was plenty of enthusiasm on tap. The audience was not slow to manifest it. So now you know, they're all out there partying. It's a good crowd, wonderful. But later, when the Democrats won the election and the advocate crowed about the victory, I'll talk about that in a second, uh, the Times noted, the Democrats, being overjoyed by their victory, made the night hideous with their hurrahs and noise-making appliances. So, okay, I guess depending on where you stand is what you see. What you see depends on where you stand. But the crowing is interesting because whenever the Democrats won, the advocate would put the chickens up there and they would crow their victories out there. So. A side note, Roosevelt, a Nobel Prize winning president, holds the distinction of being the only third party candidate to play second in a presidential election. He beat Taft, but he didn't beat Wilson. So partisanship was very much alive in community newspapers when George Mather started the Times. But these men were not wrapped up singularly in politics. Mather and others at the Times throughout the years would be community leaders in their own right, often fighting for causes that they believed in, such as the need for a community hospital, and always striving to make their communities better. In 1944, the Chamber of Commerce presented Mather with their Chamber of Commerce Award, recognition of his years of contributions to the community. He also kept and maintained a garden at the Longwell Mansion, site of the Westminster City Government. That garden is still there. The city named it in his honor in 1963 and then later rededicated it uh, a couple decades ago. <coughs> Mather was so well thought of, in fact, that he's still popular in the community and among community organizations today. Just, just last month, just last month, I got a mailing from the American Red Cross of Central Maryland asking that he join them for an event in October. Uh, we'll send his regrets. Uh, but Mather, in fact, devoted a good portion of his life and livelihood to making the Times a success. Um, but in typical fashion, he gave much of the credit to his first editor. Are you all listening? <laughs> Editors get the most credit. No. John Minton. Now, Minton would go door to door in his ho horse and buggy selling subscriptions for a dollar a year. Now, the value that readers got for that dollar according to a story on the paper's first, fourth anniversary edition, was unmatched by anything else they could spend a buck on, with the exception of one thing, a marriage license. <laughs> the Times wrote at the time, uh, we are not selfish enough to want you to feel that even the Times brings you the joy, happiness, and bliss that a marriage license should bring you. But the paper was considering itself a close second to that, for a dollar, by, by the way, a dollar a year. Mitten and H. Peyton Gorsuch, who became co-editor and the first president of the Times Printing Company when he formed, when that company was formed in 1914, helped provide that strong Republican voice that Mather craved when he started the Times. Now, another innovation which probably helped out this new paper was the uh, relatively new countywide rural free delivery. I think we probably had a box lunch talk on that at some point or another, but back on December 20th, 1899, the county was the first to start Countywide rural free delivery. So while the bulk of the readers were probably at the times were probably in Westminster, uh, they as well as others in surrounding communities could get their paper delivered to them in their mailbox every week. 
Now, Mitten started in newspapers when he was just 12 years old. And he walked into the offices of a Carroll County newspaper and sought a job. Now, in his obituary, which appeared in the Times, uh, it noted the paper that Mitten walked into as the Carroll County Democrat, but I don't think any such paper ever really existed. Um, I think they meant the Democratic Advocate, but getting titles and things wrong between each of the competing Democrats and Republicans is, was also a, a fairly common thing. So I, I imagine it was the uh, Democratic advocate that he walked into and worked at. Now at age 18, he enlisted in the Union Army. He was wounded May 5th, 1864, in the Battle of the Wilderness, and he recovered. And later he was mustered out and uh, he returned to Westminster, where he began work at the American Sentinel. He stayed there uh, until he started a printing company with C. Levine Price in 1909. And he only stayed there for a couple years before Mather tapped him to be the editor of the New Times publication. And he committed basically the rest of his life to helping grow the Times. Uh, his obituary noted that he would still come into the office right up until about three weeks before his death. And this is a quote, happy in his work, always busy preparing copy, reading proof, assisting in mailing publications and other duties. He was known as the act, oldest active newspaper man in the country at the time of his death on September 4th, 1931. He was also active in the Westminster Fire Department and he was known as the oldest active volunteer fireman at the time of his death too. Now, Gorsuch by contrast, uh, spent his life in a variety of businesses, uh, but he was never really involved with newspapers and printing until he became the first president of the newly formed Times Printing Company and co-editor of the Times in 1914. Now, Gorsuch was known as a great public speaker, uh, but when it came to the Times, it was his first page editorials which became po a popular feature each week and helped grow readership. People looked forward to these uh, down home folksy talking about issues and what needs to be done editorials every day that appeared on the front page. Gorsuch, like Mitten, Mather, and others, also gave a lot back to his community. Um, the Memorial Gateway at the Center Street entrance to the municipal grounds was something that he bought and paid for and had erected uh, all on his own because according to his obituary, which appeared after his death on June 18, 1944, he had always felt deeply disappointed that the people of Carroll County had, had failed to provide a fitting memorial for the men and women of the, of the county who had served in the First World War. J. Leyland Gor Jordan succeeded Gorsuch in June 1944 after Gorsuch's death. But the next few years would be a period of rapid change for the Times. George Mather had actually stepped away from the paper shortly after the company was formed. In 1914, he contracted tuberculosis and he spent a year in a sanatorium. And the company, at that time, the company was reorganized, the Times Printing Company was formed, Gorsuch came in and, and all those changes. But the deaths of board member Frank Mather in January of 1947 and the first business manager, Claude Kimmy, in February of that year, uh, prompted the remainder of people on the board to, to recall George Mather, ask him to come back and take control of the company that he had started. Um, just to keep it going. Uh, but after a few months, it, it, it was just too much for him and he sold the paper. So he sold it to John McCormick and J. Rollin Hunter. He still remained active in the company and right up until his death in 1965 at the age of 92. Um, our first Times printing company. McCormick, uh, by the time that the paper changed hands in 1947, the intense partisanship that had defined these newspapers throughout the early years had diminished quite a bit. A lot of that had to do with the Depression, World War I, and World War II. During that period, the newspapers, and not only us, but across the country, focused more on bringing people together and on getting communities uh, together to, to promote like the war efforts and things like that. Urging people to conserve, promoting war bond drives, helping get the word out about civil defense. Um, these all took precedence at the local newspapers. Now in World War I, another side note, in World War I, the state's compulsory work law required every male between the age of 18 and 50 to be 
regularly and continuously employed at some useful business, occupation, trade, or profession. Idleness constituted a misdemeanor offense. So, no sitting around. Uh, offenders could expect a visit from the sheriff, and they would have their name forwarded to the state's compulsory work bureau where they would find something for you to do. And of course, your name would appear prominently in the local paper. All right. Idleness in Carroll County was the exception. We have as major Carroll factories like the B.F. Shriver canning facility urged farmers to plant more crops, to grow more crops, because they didn't have enough to can so that they could send them overseas for our troops who were fighting and needed food. So, excuse me. That was more the rule than the, the working was more the rule and the idleness the exception. So the country came together again in World War II. Uh, and in May 1947, when McCormick and Hunter took over the paper, the focus had changed a bit from its partisan beginnings. Elmer Jackson joined McCormick in ownership of the Times a few years later. And on July 5th, 1956, the paper changed its name to the Carroll County Times to reflect a more countywide approach to news coverage. Of course, I still get calls from people about us being the Westminster paper. So I guess there's news about, I guess there's work that we could be doing on that uh, even now about being the countywide paper. Uh, some folks in the rural South Carroll, North Carroll, don't think we cover them as much. One problem with that is the seat of county government is here in Westminster, so a lot of our stories originate here. A lot of other, the hospitals here too, the historical societies here, the farm museums here, so a lot of stories originate here. The Arts Center is here, which of course uh, was one of the first theaters in the county, and back in the early 1990s, it would cost you a nickel to go see a movie. Um, but I stray. <laughs> An interesting thing about McCormick is that he may have single-handedly saved the paper from folding. Apparently, in 1947, uh, there was a growing consensus among, among the board members that, you know, it took a lot of time, energy, and effort to put together the paper every week. The commercial printing business was doing great, and they wanted to put more time and effort into that because that's where the, the money was. Uh, but McCormick lobbied to keep the Times going, and he was successful. Uh, but almost 30 years later, when Landmark, or when, uh, when Adam Spiegel sold the paper to Landmark Community Newspapers, the biggest reason Landmark bought the paper was because of the commercial printing business. So more on Landmark and that later, but the commercial printing business has is, is, is been a driving force throughout our history. Uh, McCormick took over duties as editor in 1951. Years later, when we were doing one of our 80th anniversary tabs, he wrote a story in there that said, you know, the other fellow wasn't writing any editorials. And I told him that was no way to run the newspaper, so I just started writing them myself. It's good. Hands-on type person. Uh, McCormick also continued to press the community and county leaders for a county hospital. It was a cause championed by our original owners, and it was a constant refrain throughout the years that Carroll County needed a hospital. Early on, uh, when uh, Mather was still the owner, they wrote stories and said, well, you know, you can't get sick on a Thursday in Carroll County because all the doctors are off on Thursday. <laughs> we need a hospital. We need some place where we can go. So, in 1944, Gorsuch left a trust fund of $20,000 to stimulate the creation of a hospital. But it would take until a few years after McCormick left for that dream to become a reality. McCormick sold the paper to Edgar and Phoebe Ray Berman in uh, 1966. Now, the Bermans would only own the paper for two years uh, before selling it to Adam Spiegel of Spiegel, Spiegel catalog fame. But it, it was the uproar that Edgar Berman created years later that it's, that's his lasting legacy in the world. Um, may remember him. He was, um, in 1970, he was a member of the Democratic Party's Committee on uh, National Priorities. And at that time, he said, women were, were unfit for leadership positions because of their raging hormonal imbalances. <laughs> women, he said, could not be effective leaders. They lacked suffic sufficient levels of testosterone. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough, the gender was so rife with inherent jealousy that no woman would ever be able to get enough votes from other women to win office. As you can imagine, 
that created a little bit of an uproar. <laughs> Too bad he wasn't the owner of the Times, because I'd have loved to have seen the letters that came pouring in after that, after all that. But, uh, but that's his claim to fame. They had long since sold the paper to Spiegel. Uh, Spiegel owned the paper for six years, and he would take the Times to twice a week, six months after buying the paper, creating a new Monday edition, and then later buy out the Democratic Advocate. So the Times would outlast its rival, Democratic Advocate. Spiegel also put a lot of resources into upgrading the uh, commercial printing business, which ultimately caught the eye of Landmark Communications, a company that in 1974 would purchase the Times. Purchasing the Times was a good investment for Landmark. It was ramping up its commercial printing business, but the purchase couldn't have come at a better time for the Carroll County Times either. Now, Landmark was under the direction of Frank Batten Sr., who during his tenure would grow the company to one of the country's largest privately held media companies that included major metros, community newspapers, specialty publications, TV stations, and even a cable network. You may have heard of the Weather Channel. In 1974, Landmark was looking to get more in, to get into the community newspaper business, but also ramp up its commercial printing businesses. And the Times provided a good opportunity for both. So the county was growing. Between 1970 and 1980, we added 27,000 people. Between 1980 and 1990, we added about that many more. A lot of people were coming into the county at the time. Retail growth came with the residential growth. So you've got retailers that are looking for a way to get the word out to the people in the county about the things they have to sell. And you've got a paper here that's just waiting for the advertisements. And the two worked well together. And we were able to grow as our community grew. For Landmark, which owned like the Virginia Pilot, other Metro newspapers, the Times was the first of many papers that, it, that would publish in the new community division. Now, the community division was formed in 1973 when Landmark purchased Newspapers, Inc. It was a little group of 18 newspapers in four states based in Kentucky. And our community division is still, today, based in Kentucky. The Times, however, was secondary to the, uh, the purchase of the Times was secondary to the commercial printing operation as far as Landmark was concerned. Um, Larry Coffey, who uh, led the community division from 1977 until he retired in 2001, said the uh, commercial printing business was the tail wagging the dog, and the dog was a poodle. So. <laughs> Landmark uh, was also a little bit surprised when it bought the paper and it found that the circulation was only about half of what Spiegel had said it was, just a couple thousand uh, subscribers. But the company saw potential in the growing market. And it devoted the resources and the money and the time necessary to grow the paper. It added a third edition in 1977. Then it moved to five days a week in 1980. In 1983, we added a Saturday edition. At the time, I was looking this up, it was interesting at the time. They said, well, people didn't like having to wait until Monday to get the scores from Friday night's high school football games. So we had to have a Saturday edition. In March 1987, the Times added a Sunday edition. Again, it was a reflection of the growing community and changes in society. More and more stores were open on Sunday. We just got in the mall, up the road. Advertisers wanted to get their information out. Their sales about specials and, and everything into readers' hands for that day. As the population grew, so did our circulation. The Times continued to grow through the 80s and 1990s. So, having previously moved from our original building on Main Street to a small house on Carroll Street to our new building in 1980, which is still our home, and growing into a seven-day-a-week publication. Now, after all that growth and everything took us up into the 90s or so, and the next big development that would come along for us would be when we began offering internet access to this new thing that Al Gore says he invented <laughs> called the internet. Thank you, Al Gore. Uh, back then, you could get 10 hours of dial-up online service for $9.95 a month, and we were going to provide it for you. And we did for a number of years. Uh, but even that technology has changed now. Instead of going to your 
big home computer and dial, using dial-up or whatever. People are getting things on their smartphones and getting the exact same thing. And the price, the costs have risen considerably for some of this stuff. But uh, it's interesting. I was complaining about my home computer the other day because it took 20, 30 seconds to upload the photos from my digital camera into the, the computer. And I was saying, this is so slow. This, this is ridiculous. Why do I have to wait so long? But when you think about it, I mean, when I was growing up and I got my first camera as a, a teenager or whatever, I would take a roll of film, you put it in an envelope, you send it out to a company, <laughs> Way, way away, you wait around for a week, 10 days, and then you get these pictures back and 90% of them are no good. Anyway, it's like, well, I got one good picture here, good. Yet, I, sp I spent all this money doing this. You know, later we were thrilled you could get one day service or two day service, you know. And then later, well, we can get digital ones, but it's gonna take a while, we're gonna do this. So just the amazing advancements that we've seen just in the last few years is, uh, Whereas it used to be, in, in, we didn't think anything of waiting a week or two for something. Now if we have to wait 30 seconds for something, it's, it's no good. Uh, think about that next time you put a potato in the microwave instead of cooking it in the oven. Uh, but the internet, developments in cell phones, other devices have drastically changed the way we communicate. Uh, Keeping pace is, of course, difficult because things that are new today are obsolete pretty much by the time you get them home and out of the box. But we've been trying to keep pace with that. We have our website, we have our e-edition, we have mobile access, we have our print publication. We're able to continue to offer local news to readers in uh, uh, whatever form they want it, basically. And we want to continue to be able to do that. We're also engaging readers much more through uh, social media, like you can follow us on Twitter, you can become a fan of us on Facebook. Um, and we continue to keep pace with the latest technological developments to help both readers and advertisers. Um, we started out as a local newspaper committed to informing the community about what was going on in their neighborhood. Back then, the only delivery method was a paper product that had to be printed taken to the post office, and delivered to your mailbox. Today, you're more likely to get electronic updates or email alerts, breaking news alerts, to your email box. Or you might log on to our website, where more than 246,000 visitors come each month to amass 1.4 million page views. 1.4 million a month. 100 years from now, Who's to say how we're going to be delivering the local news? Um, but we, we intend to be a part of that, as we have for the last 100 years. And we, continue, and we plan to continue to give back to the community, as we have for 100 years. Excuse me again. Just as our founders lobbied hard for a local hospital, and congratulations to Carroll Hospital Center, celebrating its 50th anniversary this month. Um, we're going to continue to support and advocate things that will make our communities better and it will always remain a top priority for us. Last year we contributed to, sponsored, or helped about 75 different community organizations. In addition, our coverage of those events and being able to get word out through our publications, get their listings up on our calendar, let people know what's going on, um, has helped many, many other organizations throughout the community. We built this company on the strength of our communities. And we're committed to helping them grow. Without the community support, we would still be a struggling weekly newspaper, probably in that little house on Carroll Street, barely getting by. Uh, all of us at the Times are honored to have been welcomed into your home for the past hundred years. We're humbled by the experiences that you share with us every day and allow us to share with other readers and web visitors. We look forward to continuing those traditions that were set a century ago by our founders as we continue to serve you for the next hundred years. So, thank you. If anyone has any questions,
Before I take the questions, let me take this opportunity to uh, introduce some of the other folks from our company who are here. And if you could stand up, excuse me. Uh, when I introduce you, that would be good. We have our classified ad manager, Jerry Blizzard. <laughs> Online editor, Patrick Brennan. <laughs> Advertising director, Charlie, Bl uh, Charlie Blizzard, Charlie Baker. Who, oh, by the way, in case you didn't read the story that was in the paper, Charlie came when Landmark came in 1974, and he's been here. He's an institution. He knows everything there is to know about the times. Oh, no, there's a number of years on this channel. I'm trying to catch up, and you always know. Lori Blake is our HR manager. Greg Leinard is our production manager. And Pat Richardson is our publisher. So... The, those are the folks. That's what I have. If you have questions, I'll take them now. Yes, sir. How are the twins? How are the twins? <laughs> twins are doing good. Actually, we had them at the open house along with Cameron, who just turned one year old on Friday, last Friday. So I was telling someone else earlier, this is a, uh, the, Kate, Caitlin and Connor are two and a half now. So I have to continually say, watch out for Cameron, watch out for Cameron as they're running around the house. And they ran around the house the other night and they knocked him down and he started crying. I said, you knocked down Cameron, he's crying. Oh, they run over to him, they're like, oh, are you okay, baby brother? Are you okay? And they're, and they're hugging him and everything. It's, just, it's, it's really cute what they do, but, but they're doing well. Thank you. I got a question I wanted to ask. What about Carol Rickard? Carol Record. Yeah, that was a, a paper that had a circulation within my lifetime. Yeah, there have been, there were a lot of different community papers. Uh, uh, there was a South Carroll Herald, the Union Bridge Pilot. Um, there, there were a whole bunch of, of different papers throughout the community. I'm not sure about the history of the record offhand, although I know on the Historical Society's website, if you go, you can look up the history of all the various newspapers uh, because I did that. So if you type that in um, a Google search, the Historical Society will come up and you can find the the history of that. I do have that actually in my notes in a file back at the office because I, I did look that up. It was in Tawny Town. Tawny Town. Uh, and there actually was a Carroll County Democrat paper. Was there? The, in the mid 19th century. That's not on your list. Uh, it changed its name to something else. Um, I forget what it's now. Uh, it's not Carroll County Democrat. All right. Sir. Does anybody have a handle on the what percentage of the market over the years the time that the Times had for competing newspaper, like the Old News American, the Hammond Paper? Is there any such a What was the question? Can repeat the question? Okay, the question was if there was any data on how much of the market the Times had in comparison to like the Hanover Paper, the Baltimore Sun, or things. And that, that data is out there. Um, for like the Baltimore Sun or the Hanover paper or things, we knew what the circulation was, we knew what our circulation was. In fact, when Landmark bought the paper, Hanover had a Carroll County edition and was pretty much the dominant paper in the county. Um, but as we started to grow, we assumed that position and we got the readership um, and they sort of, they pulled back a little. The same with the Baltimore Sun, who a decade or so ago ramped up and they, they put in bureaus, and not just here, but in other counties as they were trying to reach out to different areas. Well, they've since pulled back from that. But um, we've always maintained over the Sun at least a uh, comparable on what is it, comparable on daily and double on Sunday, or double on Sunday and comparable on daily. We've, we've always had the edge on circulation on them as well. And that's more so today, as they've pulled back dramatically in all of the communities, and they're focusing more on Baltimore right now. Do you remember uh, about what year the Advocate stopped publishing? The Times, uh, the slide that I had was December 31st, 1968. And in 1969, they would print some Advocate Edition inside pages of the Advocate inside the Times, and then eventually they, they just went away over the course of the next year or two. What do you think is the future of newspapers? 
that's anybody's guess, actually. I mean, newspapers, uh, I think there's always going to be a niche because there's always going to be people who like to clip things out, they like to put things in scrapbooks. I mean, printing something out of a, on a computer page just doesn't have the same feel for some people or whatever. So there's always going to be an audience, but right now the situation that we're in and that a lot of papers are in are we're serving a lot of different audiences. We have some people who, who like papers and who will probably always like papers. And I imagine some people even now who aren't really into newspapers as they get older, they may be when their kids are going to school or something, they want to clip, some, clip out a newspaper article or whatever. There's just something about um, that going out in the community. Now you've got it in online, but you know, there, there's sort of that disconnect on online. Anything can go online and anybody can say anything or do anything or whatever. But if it's in your community newspaper, it's important and it's there and, and it's something special. And I think we're always going to have that. At the same time, people are going to want to get news on their mobile phones. They're going to want to get updates through their email. They're wanna, going to want to do other things too. So we need to be able to, to serve all the various audiences as we move forward. And, and hopefully we'll be able to do that in a positive way. Um, as far as the future of print newspapers alone, that's anybody's guess. Yes, sir. What is the circulation now? Our circulation is about 25, 26,000, which is down maybe a little bit, but um, the decline isn't any worse than we have seen in other recessions or, or down economy periods when people are cutting back and they're trying to save money and, and other things. Actually, during the period a few years ago when everybody was saying how newspapers were dying and everything's going away and everything's dead, our circulation was still growing or you know we were seeing little increases in things because, again, our focus isn't the same as some of the major metro papers or the bigger papers. We're, we're community oriented. We're right here in Carroll County and, and we're providing something that people really can't get anywhere else either. And as long as we stay focused on that and remain committed to the communities that we're serving, we should be able to continue to do a good job. Um, having to pay for the extra TV guide now, is that a money thing? Right, you're trying to... Well, a lot of papers actually um, over the last few years have just eliminated them totally because, uh, and it's something we've talked about for a number of years because a lot of people have cable. They use the remote control on their cable. They can see what's on TV. They can get their listings. They can go through all the channels for all the days and everything. They don't use the TV guide, a lot of people. So in our surveys and things that we did, do you use the TV guide or, or whatever, we'd get back some responses. Some people still like it. Some use it. Um, but a lot of them don't. A lot of people, for a lot of people, it just goes right in the recycling. So, in order to cut those costs and be able to provide people with something that the ones who want it can still get it, we decided that we would continue to publish it. We put it in a new format. We improved it considerably. <clears throat> but then, yeah, we need to recoup some of those costs because it's it, it's going again to a smaller audience. Okay. Do you have a proofreading Actually, no newspapers have proofreading departments. Um, and actually, you'd be surprised. Um, even if you read something three or four or five times, things still get in. Um, one of the things, one of my personal pet peeves, I mean, because we do uh, I talk about this all the time, we, our language is constantly changing and, and whatever else. But I, who, who decided to make healthcare one word? Okay? Who, who did that, you know? But we do that. And, and if you look at the Associated Press stories and every other story and the other wire services, healthcare is one word. Well, why is it one word? So we make these changes and different things in the language. AP actually used to have a bigger structure and used to have more, um, uh, put more into the, the proofing of, of things. But I've noticed even they have slacked off a little bit or they just don't have the resources anymore. So we have to do more of that even on the wire stories. And then on the local stories, you've got um, two or three people who are working on something, you're producing from start to finish in a matter of hours um, and trying to get it done. Think about if I came up to you at 8 o'clock in the morning and said, on Tuesday and said, uh, I need somebody to put together this weekend's church bulletin. Here's the information. Can you type it up for me? And I need it back in four hours. Is it going to be perfect? Probably going to have some typos in there somewhere. Hopefully, throughout the process, 
there'll be enough eyes looking at it that we can catch things and everything else. But sometimes things do get get through that that people notice, and it's always it's always fun when when, when readers uh, do notice and let us know on things. That, cause, no, it is. It, it's good. I mean, some things that some things you know get through that actually shouldn't, and then there are other things that you just well that's the way it is because like healthcare, um, but. Uh, I think the Historical Society could probably answer that better than I. Uh, what was the question? He was at, uh, the question was about what indexes for the times are available. Uh, I don't know that there's actually an index to all of the issues. We at the Historical Society do save the obituaries and have been saving them for, I don't know, how far do they go back from the obituaries? Some of them earlier, um, and we actually we go online now um, and print them out a couple times a week and obtain hard copies of them. Uh, and uh, yes, I know we're old fashioned, <laughs> <laughs> but paper will always be there. See, so come back in hundred years, we'll love to print that. Um, since the 1980s, um, they usually actually cut them out and glue them on three by five cards and file them in an old card cabinet. <coughs> Some of the earlier ones are, are available too, and we do have what we call family history files, things like that. But I don't know that there's actually an index to the newspaper. Um, we have a lot of years on microfilm, uh, our microfilm collection. I think stops in the 1980s. Uh, but I believe the does the library get the microfilm still? Ah, uh, yes. Carroll County Public Library gets the newer ones on microfilm. We've got the older ones on microfilm. Um, so if you've got an approximate date, um, you can come in and look at the microphone and print out a little bit, something like that. Yes, sir. I use the uh, archive feature online to find all of your obituaries uh, back to about 2001. As far as it is online, in uh, 2001. Right, that's about when we started putting them online with our website. Is there a database of uh, one times papers prior to like 14 on or one of the copies of it? No, actually, and, and over the years, how things have developed, it, it's really a, a convoluted thing. The, uh, the Historical Society has our original paper versions from 1911 on, but they're <clears throat> not in good shape. And at some point in history, they made, um, they put them on microfilm. But they were, that was years later, so some of them are, are tattered or, or little, all the pages aren't there. And then later they did start getting the microfilm on them, which go all the way up through to about 1976 or so, I think. Um, so even those first editions, if you, the, the first slide that I showed you that had the first edition of the Times, well, the first edition of the Times is not in good, good enough shape to reproduce. Um, and even the microfilm version of it is not in good enough shape because it, it wasn't microfilm until much later. So the picture that we used for the first edition actually came from the 10th anniversary when they printed, it's our 10th anniversary, and they printed a copy of the front page in the middle of the front page. So what we did is we took out that first front page from the 10th anniversary edition because it was the same front page and used that um, other? Is the publisher and the owner the same thing? Uh, no, actually we're, land, we're owned by Landmark Communications and the publisher, Pat, pretty much oversees all of uh, Landmark Community Newspapers of Maryland, Inc., which includes uh, all the different things, the commercial printing that we do and, and, and the different jobs and different specialty publications, uh, the website, the uh, direct mail things that we do, pretty much everything. And another thing, um, when we were going on vacation, we would donate our papers, um, but we didn't want to have delivered to 
was something in the school. Did you still do that? And what was that? Yeah, the, the school, our NIE Newspapers and Education Program is, is something that we've had going on for a number of years. Um, and because the schools, a lot of the teachers use the newspaper in their curriculum with the students. So um, we give them papers. Now we need to recoup the cost for that. So we, we, we have a, an annual auction. Our auction is coming up actually next, uh, next month. What's the date uh, in our NIE auction? November 5th, I think. There will be ads in the paper for that. Um, and that's how we raise money uh, to pay for those papers to put in the classroom. We have the, you can donate if you go on, if you, if you stop your paper for a week while you're on vacation, you, could, you can either get your subscription six, extended for a week or you could donate those weeks worth of copies to NIE. Um, and that's what, it goes into the schools and then the students use the, the papers in their studies. Anything else? Well, I really want to thank you all for, for coming today. I didn't bring, if you didn't get a copy of uh, Henry Meter tabloid, I, uh, I brought some copies. I apparently didn't bring it up. Uh, but I'm sure you all subscribe and I'll have them anyway at home. But if you need a copy of that, uh, there's some up here. And uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it, was, it was great to be able to talk to you today. I appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for coming. Hopefully we'll see you next month. Uh, go out and enjoy the nice weather. The story of the Carroll County Times is a story of the growth of a newspaper and the community it serves. This is a story 100 years in the making. During this 100-year period, the Times, along with the entire newspaper industry, has seen many changes, from our early days of hot metal type to offset printing and cold typesetting to now publishing on the Internet. Our challenge, and what we're focused on today at the Times, is growing the core newspaper in printed form and on the web, while always meeting the needs of our readers and our advertisers. We're excited about our future and what the next hundred years will bring. While we are currently in the midst of change, some things I can tell you that will not change are our commitment to the pursuit of quality journalism, our depth of local community news coverage, and our focus on continuing service to Carroll County. Thank you. Thank you.